All right, everyone. So I want to talk to you guys about a story that I kind of missed. Uh, this story came out three days ago. I don't know how, how I missed this. Oh, yeah, now I remember. It, I think it, I'm pretty certain that this story was first reported on a Sunday, and I was probably napping. But anyway, the Chancellor of, <laughs> the chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, Angela Merkel's replacement, the successor to Merkel, Olaf Scholz, uh, stated that there must be more military autonomy within the European Union. And guys, I've been talking about the rise of Germany for years. I've been talking about the rise of, uh, of Germany in the sense that the Germans have been talking about uh, a, a, a greater Europe, a more powerful Europe. And they've been talking about the establishment of uh, a pan-European military force. But here's the thing. Every time the Germans talk about Europe, they have Deutschland in mind. They have Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber, alles in mind. It's about really a, a, a united Europe under German superiority or German supremacy. So yes, you will have a... The idea of it is, is to have a united Europe, but under... Germany. It's kind of like when the Nazis took over Croatia and they said, oh yeah, you know, uh, here's more freedom for the Croatians. And the Croats were talking about uh, an independent Croatian state. But the reality is like, what was the, the reality was, yeah, you have uh, 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 some autonomy, but it's not really an independent Croatian state. It's under Germany. Yes, you had all of these auxiliary forces under the Third Reich. You had the SS Waffen, Galassian Division, Bosnian Division, Albanian SS Division, uh, Ustasha, the, the Croatian Nazis who, who, who fought uh, uh, for, the, for the Nazis, who fought for Germany. But the reality was that Germany was still uh, at the top, and the Germans simply saw these, uh, they saw these proxies as... At the end of the day, slaves to the Germans. Uh, but anyway, th the Germans are now talking about uh, creating a more uh, uh, militarily autonomous Europe. And what they really mean by this is really a, a, a pan-European powerhouse ran by Germany. This is the Fourth Reich. You are seeing the formation of it. Um, you can say, well, Ted, it was already there with the EU. I, I don't really want to go that far because at the end of the day, the EU uh, has been controlled by the United States. But what is happening is America's control over Germany is beginning to dwindle. The Americans are pulling away. They are pulling the leash. They're taking the leash off of uh, the, the uh, ravenous German dog that was defeated uh, in the Second World War. And was placed under the yoke of the Americans, just like Japan was placed under the yoke of the Americans. That's why when they say, oh, the Japanese constitution forbids the use of, of any sort of uh, military infrastructure. The, the Japanese constitution, everybody, uh, was created by the United States and imposed by the United States. That is not the Japanese constitution. That is the, uh, the U.S. occupied Japanese constitution. Uh, and so here you have Olaf Scholz saying, no, we need some more autonomy, more military autonomy. So here's the article. This is on DW. Again, I don't know how I missed. Oh, yeah, I remember how I missed this. I was napping pretty much all throughout Sunday. But anyway, Chancellor Olaf Scholz has renewed calls for the European Union to be reformed to allow more countries to join the bloc. So they want to make the EU bigger. And a lot of this talk about expanding the EU, I noticed that it really began to intensify after Brexit. After Brexit, after the referendum was done and most of the people who voted uh, in Britain voted for Brexit, there was more talk about uh, getting more and more people in. Uh, that's why for a number of years now, we've been hearing uh, discussions uh, in Europe about getting Bosnia into the European Union, getting Albania, getting Kosovo into the European Union. They want to get these countries into the EU. Croatia is already a member of the EU. Uh, so if they can get more Balkan countries in, imagine how a, a pan-European military force led by Germany would look like. Imagine this. You have 
a big German Bundeswehr. You have integrated European forces in the Bundeswehr, like uh, European, uh, uh, sorry, you have like uh, military units from the Netherlands in the Bundeswehr. And you already have something like that already, believe it or not. You already have, uh, I, I want to say there's at least like one Dutch military unit in the Bundeswehr, if I'm not mistaken. So they, they have already began this project. Uh, but imagine you have this pan-European military force led by Deutschland, and here you have Bosnian auxiliaries, you have Croatian auxiliaries, uh, Albanian. It's like, oh my God, it's the SS all over again. Here you have the Fourth Reich and you have your Balkan units. Oh, what's this military force? Oh, that's our Bosnian division. Oh, kind of like the Waffen SS in the Balkans. Oh, this is our Croatian division. Oh, like the Ustasha. And here's, a, here's another thing that's crazy is the Germans are training or are going to be training thousands upon thousands of Ukrainian fighters. Uh, this is a, a plan that's uh, projected to happen. It's not happening right now, but they're planning on making it happen. Uh, the Germans uh, want to train 15,000 Ukrainian fighters. And of course, this is considered a European project. Uh, but they, they have said uh, that uh, the EU has never undertaken such uh, a training uh, project. They've never trained this many uh, people from uh, a country that's not in the European Union. Imagine that, 15,000 Ukrainians, and please don't tell me that there would be no Nazis in such a group. We know for a fact that the Canadians have trained Ukrainian Nazis because the Ukraini the uh, Canadians trained a whole bunch of Ukrainian fighters. And you can look into this yourself. It just so happened a lot of them were confirmed Nazis. So the Germans are, are going to be... the Okay, let, let me be more correct. The EU, which is led by Germany, is going to be training 15,000 Ukrainian fighters. Uh, I'm going to guess that almost 100% of these admire Stefan Bandera. I'm going to guess that almost 100% of these, because you may have one Ukrainian who doesn't like Stepan Bandera. Okay, I'll grant that. So let's say 98% of these are going to be admirers of Ukraine's World War II historical heroes. Stepan Bandera, Melnik, uh, uh, Shukhovich, Roman Shukhovich, all murderers, all mass murderers. Uh, I'm going to guess that most of these fighters are going to be admirers of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, which joined the SS to butcher Poles and Jews. So the European Union is going to be training Nazis. The European Union wants more autonomy, which means what we are witnessing, everybody, is the formation of the Fourth Reich. We are witnessing a giant European powerhouse led by Germany becoming independent of American control. This is what we are watching. We are watching this monster form, this, this Frankenstein. So this article from DW goes on to say uh, that Scholz was speaking at the Congress of the Party of European Socialists. This is, this is golden, everybody. This guy, the Chancellor of Germany, is talking about European military autonomy to European socialists. <laughs> yeah. What were the Nazis called, everybody? National Socialists? Okay. I'm just going to leave that out there, okay? So he said it was important to reform some of the EU's treaties so that the new members could join. A united European Union, this is what he said, a united European Union of 27, 30, 36 states with more than, with more than, with more, with then more than 500 million free and equal citizens can bring its weight to bear even more strongly in the world. So in other words, you want to become a world superpower. That's what that means. We want to, we want to uh, uh, pull our weight around, throw, throw our weight around. I am committed to the enlargement of the EU, that the EU continues to grow eastward, and a win-win for all of us, that the EU continues to grow eastward. That's significant. Expanding east, which means expanding into the Balkans, perhaps even including the Ukraine into the European Union. That would be crazy, because then you, you would have this country of 40 million Ukrainians, part of the European Union, under German power, under the under German supremacy, I mean, it, it would be like the Second World War, Germany training Ukrainians, and that's exactly what happened during the Second World War. 
not exactly. Ukraine wasn't a part of, you know, some European super state. But the Germans did train tens of thousands of Ukrainian nationalists during the Second World War. I believe in the 1930s, they brought in tons of these Ukrainian fascists into Germany and trained them, I think also into, into uh, Austria as well. There were all these training camps in Germany, and that's how they formed all these Ukrainian fighters. That's how they trained them all, and they sent them back uh, to to Poland, to Ukraine, and they butchered all these Polish people, and it was a horrific massacre. They are planning on training these Ukrainians today, Ukrainian nationalists today, and when it says expanding eastward, I'm wondering if that also means integrating uh, Ukraine into the European Union. That would be insane. Because then, let's say there's some kind of a ceasefire or something. I don't know. Who knows? I I, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Scholz also pushed for changes to Bloch's unanimity principle. Now, this is very interesting. Because right now, the e if the EU wants to do something in regards to foreign policy, it needs a unanimous vote, okay? All EU members must agree. Scholz wants to change this. He wants to make it into a majority vote. So instead of, instead of keeping the system where you need a, you need a unanimous agreement to, do, to conduct foreign policy uh, amongst the, um, you need a unanimous vote uh, amongst uh, all uh, EU states in order to conduct foreign policy, um, instead of having that system, you would have, you, you would just need a majority vote. So 51% of EU countries want to, I don't know, go to war with Russia, then there's a war with Russia. Imagine that. Let's say Germany wants to declare war on Russia. And these other EU countries, some of them don't, some of them want to. Imagine, let's say Hungary doesn't want to go to war with Russia. But if most of them do then you'll have a war. So he wants to make it easier to conduct foreign policy. What that means is he wants to make it easier to send EU troops to other countries. So you're seeing the German-led military powerhouse being formed. Now, this all may change in the future. Other countries might leave the European Union. But I think at the end of the day, regardless of what happens, what you will have in the future is a German... Uh, 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 superpower in Europe and you will have countries under that superpower. It may not be exactly what we see today in the EU, but I think regardless, at the end of the day, you're going to have countries under German control and you may have countries that will revolt from German control. We'll have to see what happens in the future. Uh, and then he says, it says here in the article, and this is a quote from Scholz, but I also say clearly, if a geopolitical Europe is our aspiration, then majority decisions are a gain and not a loss of sovereignty. And the article says, he said he supports more military autonomy of the EU and called for coordinated procurements of weapons and equipment, as well as the establishment of an EU rapid reaction force by 2025. In the future, Europe will need a coordinated increase in capabilities. By capabilities, it, he means a more powerful military force. We must confidently and jointly advance European defense. So here you have it, everybody. And, and Scholz himself has said that he wants Germany to be the most powerful country in Europe militarily. Well, Germany is already the most powerful economy in Europe. So now he wants to make Germany the most powerful country in Europe militarily. So not only will Germany have the power through its currency, it will also have the power through uh, firepower, uh, power at the end of the barrel. So what we're looking at is the formation of the Fourth Reich with a very powerful military force, because in order to be a powerful country, you have to have the capability of force. And so the fact that Germany is pursuing becoming the most powerful military in Europe means that they want to be able to advance their hegemony, not just through money, but through um, firepower. This is the bottom line. There is another thing that I want to talk to you guys about, and that is um, this idea of German auxiliary forces. Uh, Germany wants to include other European militaries into a essentially a, a pan-European military force, led by Germany, of course. That would mean that Croatia's military 
would be a part of this force. Croatia, anyone who has studied this will know this. Croatia has a long history of, or I should say a very bloody history of fascism. Uh, Croatia had the Ustasha back in the Second World War, which butchered mainly Serbs, but butchered other people, Jews, Gypsies. And together they killed around a million people during the Second World War. Fast forward to the 1990s when um, Croatia uh, revolted against Yugoslavia, no longer wanted to be under Serbian control, and uh, went to war with Serbian nationalists within its borders. And so after uh, Croatia declared independence, you had these Serbs who uh, wanted to maintain uh, Serbian power within Croatia, so they formed their own state within the country. It was uh, it was called the uh, Republic of Serbian Kraina, I believe, which means uh, a Serbian Republic at the border, because Kraina means at the border or at the edge. That's what Ukraine means, right? The country at the border, the country on the edge. And so there was a war between the Croats and the Serbs uh, within Croatia, it was a very bloody war, uh, and there was a very bloody battle uh, called Operation Storm. Uh, basically, before the war between Russia and Ukraine now, this battle had the largest deployment of troops um, in basically uh, in post-World War II European history. So largest military deployment after the Second World War, but now that's been eclipsed by the war between Russia and Ukraine. So Operation Storm uh, was a very, uh, very decisive battle in which the Croats defeated the Serbs, although the Serbs were doing pretty well in the beginning. But thanks to NATO support, Croatia won. After the war, uh, a lot of the Serbs left Croatia. They either went to Bosnia or they went back to Serbia. And uh, there were people that were left behind. These were mainly uh, elderly folks who were too frail to move. So uh, a lot of these people were murdered by Croatian forces. You can read it. You can look into this yourself. Uh, Wikipedia has a very detailed um, explanation on Operation Storm, very detailed uh, article on this uh, battle. And uh, even the Wikipedia article makes it quite clear that most of the war crimes that were committed uh uh, during and after this battle were done by the Croatians. And uh, there were a number of massacres that were done in which a lot of elderly Serbian folks were murdered. So I want to read to you guys an excerpt from an article that talks about this. It's from uh, Balkan Insight, and it talks about the atrocities that were done uh, after the battle. And it says here, it talks about this massacre that took place, and it says, This was the month when Croatia launched Operation Storm, a majority military offensive aimed at retaking territory held since 1991, etc. When the Croatian army's attack on Serb positions uh, started, Witness 67, this is a, a witness that wanted to remain a, anonymous. She didn't want to give her name for obvious reasons. Witness 67's neighbors from the village started to flee. In the afternoon of August 6, 1995, Witness 67 went to a nearby house where she found three soldiers with seven civilians. When one of the soldiers spotted her, he ran after her, hit her on the arm with his rifle butt, and forced her to join the others. The soldiers made them move towards a nearby factory. On the way, they tore up some of their identity documents and insulted them. When the group came to a nearby road, two of the soldiers went off with two of the captured civilians. The third soldier made the others return to the village, insulting and threatening them. Then he spotted one more civilian who he ordered to join the group. Now, this is when things get interesting. The soldier drew a U, symbol of the Croatian World War II fascist Ustasha movement. These were the mass murdering Croatian Nazis in the dust and stated that it was the golden letter after which he sprayed bullets at the group with an automatic rifle gun said the first instance verdict in the trial of Croatian wartime generals Anta Gotovina, Mladan Markac, and Ivan Cermak. Witness 67 was the only survivor of the shooting. So here you have soldiers in the mid-90s, Croatian soldiers praising the Ustasha, and before they murdered these Serbs, this soldier drew a U representing the Ustasha on the ground before murdering them. So here you have Croatian Nazis in the 90s, and believe me, they're still in Croatia today. 
Yes, I know uh, you have uh, some social Democrats who are dominating the government or whatever, but the reality is that it's still there, just like Ukraine. That nationalism is still there. So imagine if, let's say, Croatian soldiers are now integrated into this supra-European state. Don't tell me there would be no Nazis in it. You would have a Croatian division, and it would be like the SS division under Germany. History, history doesn't exactly repeat itself, okay? Mark Twain said that history does not repeat, but it rhymes. And I heard another interesting take on this today that I find really good. History does not repeat itself, but it echoes. So yes, in the past, there was no EU, there was a rising Germany, it became an empire, it conquered other countries, it made proxies, it made military units of other European countries, and these units committed atrocities. After the war, you had the formation of the EU, which was, which was basically America telling the Germans, look, we don't want to have a war with you guys again, we know that you guys love money, so here is Europe, you can have your European state, here it is, okay, America supported it. America allowed it. They, they united East and West Germany together. Uh, eventually, you have the formation of the European Union. Basically, it's Germany's economy dominating Europe. Okay, this was part of a, the plan that was formed before the end of the Second World War. And that was it. It was a way just to keep Germany pacified. But what's happening? You had Brexit. Britain left. America is becoming more isolationist. America is, be is beginning to leave its position as the dominating force. So the Germans are saying, okay, now we got to basically go back to being a powerful military again. That's what's happening, everybody. That's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. So what's also interesting is the idea of a, of a European state, the idea of a massive European state, that was the dream of the Nazis. There are numerous quotes that you can read. Of uh, Janusz Varoufakis talks about this in, his, uh, in one of his uh, books. Uh, I think it was uh, Adults in the Room. He talks about the, how the Nazis wanted, the, wanted to form a pan-European state. They wanted to form a European Union. A European Union with one currency. The Nazis wanted it. So basically, after the Second World War, the Germans got what they wanted. They got this European Union that they wanted. But it's under American control to make sure the Germans don't go crazy. But what's happening? America is slowly giving up its control. It's removing the leash which means that this EU basically being what the Nazis wanted to a certain extent, not completely, but to a certain extent, it's, it's, what, what, it's what the Nazis wanted. Now imagine this European Union under German control without American control. Imagine that. It's going to be the Fourth Reich. Anyway, guys, you guys just heard some theology. God bless.
настала вновь И воздух пленел Когда я вернулся к большой земле Они рассказали, как сорт человек О том, что приемник всегда молчал Они зовут ее в 